Let's talk about the parts of a whistle. Let's talk about tin whistles in general. Of all of my whistles here that I showed in a previous video, only one of them is made out of tin. This one, the Clark, the original. And of course, that's where the tin whistle name comes from, from the Clark original tin whistle. Rolled up piece of tin, conical bore, tapers. The theory there is that tapering the bore allows the bottom notes and the top notes to have the same volume, the same strength. But most whistles today are made with a straight bore. Mr. Clark, if you look this up on the internet, Mr. Clark didn't invent the tin whistle. He, there were whistles that could have been called tin whistles before he started making whistles. But what he did is he developed the techniques of making a whistle cheaply enough so that it could be sold for a penny. And the whistle caught on. It became the instrument of choice for those who couldn't afford most other instruments. And it invaded all kinds of musical scenes over the next few years. One of those, of course, was the Irish music scene. The story is that, that itinerant workers from Ireland who were working in England in the factories there picked up the tin whistles that were a penny apiece and took them back to Ireland and started playing their traditional music using the penny whistle. And it soon caught on as an instrument that was used in most Irish music. Therefore, Irish whistle. So we've got tin whistle, made of tin, penny whistle, cost a penny, Irish whistle, used in Irish music. You could call it the Scottish whistle. In fact, some people do. If you go online, you can find Walton's packaged whistles that are labeled Scottish whistles. Of course, they're the same as penny whistles, Irish whistles, any penny whistle, any tin whistle. The parts. Well, you've got the barrel and you've got the head. Now you will see this called sometimes the fipple, but it's not the fipple. The original Clark whistle, as I said, was just a, a rolled piece of tin with a piece of wood jammed in the end, a little sliver taken off the top of the wood to make a very narrow passage, and then a hole punched here where the air could escape. That was a tin whistle. And that little block of wood was called the fipple comes from also from pipe organ manufacture where that the the block of wood or other, some other material that blocks the end of the tube and forms the windway is called the fipple the windway you can see here the space between the fipple and the tube or the head it's called the roof the roof of the head forms a little passage and what happens is when you blow your breath is compressed and goes through that little passage there and comes out the other end as a stream, as a technical term, but as a stream. Fairly smooth flow of air, compressed at much higher velocity than when you are just breathing. That's the basis of the tin whistle. Then connected to the head or mouthpiece, this is called the beak here, the beak of the mouthpiece. And you have here the voicing window, or sometimes just the window. And if you can see there, see that little slope on the inside of the voicing window? That's called the blade. And it can be rounded like this one is. It can be flat straight across like this one. And it has an influence on the tone of the whistle, volume of the whistle, all kinds of characteristics of the whistle, the shape and the positioning of that blade. You have different kinds of windway. I showed you this one, which was curved. Many of them, especially on the cast plastic heads, will be straight. There you go. That's what's called a flat windway. Then you have the Dixon whistles, and they have a flat floor, if you want to say, and arched roof at this end, at the mouth end. When it comes out the other end, if you could look in there and see, you'd see that it's flat. So it's just another way of compressing the air. On a whistle like this, the wind waste starts out this wide and it ends up this wide. So it's compressing the air by channeling it in. And that increases, again, the speed of the air coming out. If you have a cast head like this, it doesn't have a fipple. Here you can see the fipple. 
This one happens to be plastic, but that replaces the wood block that blocks the tube. When you cast a head like this, there's no fipple. Inside here, there's just a cast windway, and underneath it is hollow. That's one of the things that causes the problem with the cast head, is that hollow underneath the windway. All whistles, then the head is attached to the tube or the barrel. The barrel has a bore, that's how big around it is. It has a sit, set length for any given key. As you see, these whistles are all almost exactly the same length. If you lined up the windows and the blades, they would be just about exactly the same length. The barrel has six holes. Now what happens when you blow through the whistle is that stream of air closes off this little window and forces all the air to go down the tube. But because of a principle called Bernoulli's principle, when the air strikes the inside of the window, the pressure drops. So the little stream flaps like that. And that vibration is what produces the sound. Now, if it were just the sound coming out of, out of here, ooh, hear how high pitched that is? That's the sound that the whistle actually makes. When you connect it to a tube, however, that vibration of the air at the window sets up a resonant vibration in the length of the tube. Now, any given length of tube, there's only one sound wave that fits in there cleanly. And over a microsecond or two, that sound wave dominates. It wipes all the other sound waves out. And that is determined solely by the length of the tube and the diameter. So for this whistle, its dominant resonant frequency is the D note, the number of cycles per second that forms the D note in our musical scale. You have holes, and effectively, as you open these holes, you shorten the tube. And every time you shorten the tube, the pitch of the resonant frequency, the standing wave in there, goes up. And you get a higher note, a higher note, higher note, higher note. The reason it takes more breath to sound the higher notes than the lower notes is because that short column of air between here and here is much harder to vibrate than the long column of air, that your low note is gonna take less breath, less energy than your high notes. You have to exert more pressure, speed up the wind flow as you go up the scale. Two of the factors to the tuning of the whistle are the length of the barrel and the diameter of the barrel. So these two have different diameter barrels. And you would expect, and indeed it's true, that they're different lengths. This is the only whistle I have that's really noticeably different in length. And that's because it has the larger barrel. I shouldn't say that. I actually have a big bore high D whistle. And of course, that is even shorter. The other factor that influences the, the actual frequency of the note is the size and placement of the holes. You see, each hole is slightly different, even more obvious here. And that has to do with tuning the whistle, with making the whistle sound the correct notes. The size of the hole is related to the thickness of the material. And it's also related to the particular tuning tone that you want to create. You can change the tone by increasing and decreasing the size of the holes. And that's basically it. That's how a whistle works. It's never too late to whistle, and I hope you have fun with it.